So in this lecture, we're going to look at um, how to actually do a Williamson ether synthesis. So just got a blinding light of sun. Um, anyway, um, we're going to first make or buy an alkoxide. Okay, now to do that, we have to, let's remind ourselves, an alkoxide looks like hydroxide, but it's got an R group instead of, an, um, instead of uh, a hydrogen. Um, so we had RO minus, a specific example, just one of many is when we have that R group is a methyl group, okay. So what we do here is we add a suitable base to an alcohol. Add a suitable base to an alcohol. So when we do that, we have R, O, H, this is an alcohol that reacts with some base. Bases have negative charges and they're attracted to acidic hydrogens. Acidic hydrogens are hydrogen atoms on electronegative elements like an oxygen. So um, we're going to let the negative charge go to the positive. This is a delta plus. We're gonna push the negative charge that was between the oxygen and hydrogen over to the O. So this is an acid base reaction, but it looks a lot like an SN2 reaction, right? Because we form a new bond between the hydrogen and the base. The hydrogen gets attacked because of its delta positive character. And the leaving group is the um, conjugate base of the alcohol. Okay. With this in mind, let's ask ourselves, what is a suitable base? What is a suitable base? So NaOH, that's a good base, right? That's a strong base by definition. Um, no, not strong enough for making uh, an alkoxide. Turns out that alkoxides are more basic than hydroxides. Alcohols are less acidic than water. Okay, so what we wanna do instead is use something like NaH, which is sodium hydride. Now, if you notice, we have the IDE suffix that implies a negative charge. And what we used to do with things that have um, sodium attached to them is just cross out the sodium and put a negative charge on whatever it's attached to. That was a common habit that we did in organic chemistry one. Same with some other metals like lithium and potassium. So let's remind ourselves of that. We have sodium here. That's a cation cation, excuse me, plus one. That actually means that hydrogen in this case is not plus one, but it's um, minus one. It's an anion, it has minus one character to it. It's kind of a weird looking molecule or weird looking ion, excuse me. If we have hydrogen minus one, how do we get there? Well, hydrogen's group one minus zero bonds minus two electrons gets us to negative one. So hydrogen here actually has a lone pair of electrons. Now, if we notice with two electrons on H, that's an octet. And you're like, wait, isn't an octet imply eight? Well, no, it's a filled shell. So hydrogen has um, um, hyd the neutral hydrogen element with one electron puts that electron in the um, one S orbital, the S orbital within the first shell. And an octet implies that we have a full shell excluding um, D orbitals. And so we don't have those in the first shell. All we have is this S orbital. We don't even have P orbitals. So filling the shell means filling the S orbital, which holds only two electrons. So this is its octet. So hydride is H1 minus. This is a strong base. So hydride, H, the lone pair and a negative one charge is a strong base. Well, why is it a strong base? Well, let's look at what happens when it reacts with a Bronsted acid, that is H plus. So H plus has no electrons. That's how it gets to the plus one charge. H minus one has two electrons. We can let, we can go from either the negative one charge or the lone pair of electrons and attack the atom with the positive charge. And when we do that, we form a pretty stable molecule. This is, well, it's an okay stable molecule. This is hydrogen gas actually. And so it floats away. 
So H minus is sort of desperate to form this bond with itself to make hydrogen gas. And then because it floats away, this is a reversible, excuse me, an irreversible, that is not reversible, acid-base reaction. For it to go backwards, the hydrogen gas that just boiled away would have to go back down into solution and then be acidic enough to give back a, a hydrogen, which is difficult to do because um, there's no difference in electronegativity between the two hydrogen atoms. Okay, excuse me. What this means is we can use sodium hydride as our base to make our alkoxide which is again, step one of the Williamson ether synthesis. So in practice, we could take something like methanol and react it with sodium hydride. And maybe you wanna go through and cross out that metal, replacing the metal with a negative charge to remind yourself that hydride has a negative one charge on hydrogen. And let's go ahead and just scribble that a little bit so we can see the bond between oxygen and hydrogen. We're going to let the negative one charge attack the delta positive on the hydrogen and push electrons in towards the electronegative oxygen element. That will give rise to this structure, which is countered by the sodium that floated away and we crossed out. And we make H2 gas that literally floats away as a gas. And I just show that arrow saying it's kind of bubble out of solution. And this is indeed what happens when you use sodium hydride, you add it to the reaction, it will form bubbles. And that's how you know, I guess it's active and hasn't been neutralized by atmospheric moisture. Now, when you do this, you get your alkoxide. This is the nucleophile for the SN2 reaction that when we form an ether, um, somebody named Williamson took credit for. Maybe Williamson was a good scientist. I'm sure they were. So um, doesn't mean we have to, whatever. Okay, it's an SN2 reaction. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with that part. Okay, so what about, um, there, there's, uh, let's, let, what about some other elements that we can sort of just cross out? So is sodium the only element we can just cross out? And the answer is, well, no, we can actually consider other metals. So again, uh, the answer is no. We could also do lithium and potassium, okay. And that's because if we look at the periodic table, it kind of goes like this. We got lithium, um, sodium, and potassium. So this is group one. And then above that's hydrogen, but I'm gonna delete hydrogen as quickly as I draw it because we don't wanna be um, including that in our discussion, okay. So we can include lithium and potassium. When we see those, we can also consider those as strong bases. So for example, a really common potassium base is potassium tert-butoxide. In organic chemistry one, we call this our E2 base. Um, so it's KO, and it looks like this, or KOTBU. And we could, in both cases, cross out the KOTB toxide. I'll just redraw it down here so you've got the full structure along with the um, crossed out uh, metal structure. So that we can see the negative charge resides on the oxygen. Turns out this is an alkoxide in and of itself. So it's hysterically hindered. I still don't know if sterically is a word, but it's a sterically hindered alkoxide, which means it's a good base. It won't really do SN2 reactions for us. So if we mixed it with another alcohol, we'd probably see um, the equilibrium favor protonation of the potassium tert-butoxide anion to make a new anion that is likely less sterically hindered, making it possible for, oh, I just, just took that off screen, sorry, making it possible to use this as a base instead of seeing a competing SN2 reaction. Okay, now that's potassium. So if we see K, we can cross that out, replace it with negative charge, Na. What about lithium? So lithium 
Um, many times we see that, uh, well, it's true. So lithium is the same. So if we had um, lithium, you don't see it too much, but well, there is there is uh, lithium hydride, sure. You don't, you don't use it too much. It's not as easy to work with as sodium hydride, easy to get, ex get access to. So that could also be um, H minus if you cross out the lithium. But where you really see lithium is in organolithiums. So these are um, easy to access. Easy to access, very strong bases. And by easy to access, I mean like easy to purchase. Um, And they're very strong bases, some of the strongest bases that you'll use. Now, if we look at these, a common one is N-butyl lithium. So these are called organolithiums because the lithium is directly attached to carbon. So it's not an alkoxide in this case, it's LIR for example, lithium directly bonded to a carbon atom. These are pretty wonky molecules, but they do the same tricks. So if we take this um, organolithium, we can cross out the lithium. It's a little bit awkward because lithium forms a sort of um, a, a bond that has a little bit more covalent character than we would see with sodium. So it does have a line. But if we if we cross that out, we could redraw the butyl chain with the negative charge. We also want to cross out the bond then because again, it's not as um, ionic is what we would typically expect. So we have to draw a line, but if we cross out the metal, we have to also include the line. So we have here now a basic carbon. So it's not, I'm just gonna emphasize this, it's not this, um, because now we have a carbon chain that's five long. We don't draw a bond to a negative charge. Okay, so not this. So here we have our basic carbon. And what we can do is the same sort of tricks. So if we have uh, this experiment is making me a bit nauseous. I'll get to why in a second. So if we do this, we could indeed form, let's cross out the bond and the metal and we get negative charge. The negative charge is attracted to the delta positive and we could give rise to this. Now what's cool is the um, product is butane after deprotonation and our oxygen is going to be countered by lithium plus. Okay so it's a really helpful base, super strong. It has a pKa in the 40s, um, the kind you get acid does, butane. So we can really deprotonate a lot of stuff, not just alcohols. In fact you would say this is probably overkill for alcohols, definitely. You'd probably just use sodium hydride or something. The issue though is um, organolithiums, like I said, this uh, makes me a little bit nauseous and that's because um, they're a little bit scary. Well, they're a lot of bit scary if you don't know what you're doing, but um, you have to be careful. So these are, this is an example of a pyrophoric material. Now I'm gonna cross out m lithium. There's no, I'm kind of confusing advanced organic with organic too. I'm just gonna write organolithium in general. Now with a typical or normal or straight chain butane, which is what we used above, that's a very common example of a um, organolithium. But these are pyrophoric, which means they um, detonate upon exposure to moisture. Well, that seems problematic because moisture is sort of everywhere in the air. And indeed, if you're handling a syringe full of this stuff and you blow it in the back of the hood, you'll see some smoke, and probably some flames. Um, so you don't want to do that. These things are really bad. People have died in their mishandling of them and not mishandling like didn't know what they were doing, like sort of a trained chemist and um, sort of trained chemists just make mistakes because you do enough science, you're going to make mistakes over the years. And um, they've had a mishap with the organolithiums. And we don't um, sadly have those people on the planet anymore. Okay, more about that in advanced organic. So 
what we have here are three approaches to generate our alkoxide um, reactants, our alkoxide nucleophiles for the Williamson ether synthesis. So we could take ROH and we could react it with sodium hydride. We could react it with butyl lithium, or we could react it with potassium tert-butoxide. And we could just get the alkoxide with various metal counter ions, depending on our application, our choice of solvent, um, the acidity of our alcohol, um, these uh, bases would have various kind of uses. So it's nice to have choices. So this is our alkoxide. We really haven't done a Williamson ether synthesis yet, but I keep trying to harp on the fact that this is um, just an SN2 reaction. So the hardest part or the newest part may be just generating the alkoxide. But once you're there, you can just do, well, you can just add to a halo alkane. I should add, oh, I did that, okay. So with the alkoxide in hand, just add to a halo alkane. So what we could do is we could take our alkoxide and let's say we've got an OLI here and then let's change the alkoxide and make it an OK. We're gonna add to a few different halo alkanes. And let's predict the products here. So we'll fill those in. Well, in the first case, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start by crossing out the lithium. I could just go ahead and cross out the potassium too. Negative, negative. Now I have a delta positive on the carbon that's attached to the leaving group, which is our halogen. Could be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Bromine's the best. Iodine's a little bit too reactive, but we can make use of it sometimes. And we just um, draw our curly arrows from the negative charge to the positively charged carbon, delta positive, positively charged, partially positive charged carbon. And we push the electrons that were between the carbon and the halogen onto the halogen atom to make sure that we don't exceed the octet on the carbon atom. Let's treat that. I don't want to lose any carbon atoms. And I just draw what things look like after I connect the pieces to each other. So we have here. Just want to make sure you don't lose any atoms. So there would be the um, new uh, products. So we've solved the question. Because we now know how to make alkoxides, we could actually separate this into a couple of steps. That is, I could, let's make this a two-step procedure. Let's say I've got my alcohol and I first add to that in step one, sodium hydride, and then in step two, I add some sort of haloalkane. Well, let's look, what happens here? If we have a question mark, what do we make? Well, let's first recognize that the sodium hydride is just a hydride base. And then we're going to add that to an alcohol, which is just a delta plus on the hydrogen, delta minus on the oxygen, negative is attracted to the delta positive. We push the electrons onto the oxygen atom, and that will give rise to an alkoxide intermediate. We could calculate the formal charge in the oxygen to prove that to ourselves. Group six element. Now we have three lone pairs and one bond that gives us a negative charge. So what we're gonna do now is this is, so first of all, this is step one. And then we, what we do is we take the product of step one and we add it to whatever we were using in step two. So that would be this plus Our haloalkane. Our haloalkane has a delta positive on carbon, a delta minus on the bromine atom. The negative charge in the oxygen will be attracted to the positive charge. 
that's attracted that's uh, attached to the bromine, but we cannot exceed the octet, so we have to push the electrons over to the bromine atom to let the leaving group leave, and that will give rise to a product. Let's draw it without rotating as much as we can. So there's our oxygen half, and we've connected to this carbon, which corresponds with this carbon. Let me draw the rest of our molecule over there. Drawn it with minimal um, rotation, but here's an answer to the question. Okay. If you notice when I solve these, okay, I, it's not like it's not like uh, math that you want to do in your head or you just like look at it and know the answer. I mean, sometimes if you've done this for a while, but that's really not that useful. What is definitely much more useful is to be able to draw mechanisms for the transformations. We're going to continue this um, by talking about the chemistry of ethers. That is, now that we know how to make ethers, what can we do with them? What reactions and transformations do they undergo? I mean, the whole class is going to be a lot of reactions. The, the uh, approach to the class that you want to take is to learn the mechanisms for the reactions. Learn the mechanisms. This really should be entitled the mechanisms, common mechanisms in organic chemistry. That's what I love to entitle this course. Um, but it's not. Okay, whatever. People recognize organic too, and they know what that means. So as you're studying, as you're trying to learn these things, learn the mechanisms, then go to the examples and apply the mechanisms towards the examples. Do not memorize each um, example individually. Okay. And with that, we'll sort of end this lecture. We'll pick up with chemistry of ethers, moving away from the Williamson ether synthesis um, in the next lectures.